Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to start our last plenary panel that is held in cooperation with the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Ms. Marina Kallurand, who is the chair of the commission, will moderate this panel with these very distinguished speakers. As always, last sessions of SICON are future-oriented, and I'm sure that the panelists can provide their perspective on the topic of cyber stability and the future of the Internet. So again, Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Good morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank SICON for including this topic into the agenda, and I would like to also li thank SICON for letting us representatives of the Global Commission to present our future work. And we just have a small part of Commission on the stage. Majority of commissioners are in the audience, as well as secretariat, as well as res advisory, research advisory group. But ladies and gentlemen, I would say that there are many international organizations that are discussing cybersecurity, cyber stability, they are starting from the United Nations, finishing with regional organizations. And at the same time, we are hearing complaints. We are hearing complaints from industry that they are not involved. We are hearing complaints from, from academia, from civil society, that their voice is not heard as much as they would like it to be heard. So. Uh, there, I, I have a feeling that there is something missing in international discussion on security, on cybersecurity and cyber stability. So the time is right for the Global Commission, a platform involving people from different fields of activities, people from different countries with different experience to get together and to share our views, to share our experience, and to come with our proposals and recommendations to states and governments. The Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace was initiated by the Dutch government, and here I'd like to thank the Dutch government for doing that. It was launched in Munich at the Munich Security Conference and today in the afternoon we will have the first full meeting of the Commission. Needless to say, I'm personally very happy that it's going to take place in Tallinn. So it will be written in the history books. <laughs> the first meeting of the Commission in Tallinn. So what is the mission of the Commission? To develop proposals for norms and policies to enhance international security and stability, and guide responsible state and non-state behavior in cyberspace. What does it mean? In other words, it means providing stable internet, accessible internet, promotion of the use of ICTs for the benefits of all people. I'm sure that the Commission has a genuine opportunity to contribute in that field. The Commission consists of 26 independent commissioners. And again, personally, I'm happy that there are eight women among us. We can do better, but not bad, if we look at the audience here and if we look at the speakers yesterday and today. The Commission will engage uh, the full range of stakeholders to develop shared understandings, advance cyber stability by supporting information exchange, capacity building, basic research, advocacy. The work of the Commission is supported by research advisory group, and I'm happy to say that we have two co-chairs and chair, Sean Kanuk of the research advisory group here today with us. The Commission will not replace any of the existing forums, any of the existing formats discussing cybersecurity, but of course, it will be linked to existing initiatives such as the 
Global Commission on Internet Governance and the London process. So we intend to prepare a report in three years with recommendations, guidelines to states and governments. We will not disappear into the woods for three years. We hope to work openly, transparently, and keep you posted about our deliberations, about our discussions, with the capable assistance of Secretariat, which is run by the support of Alex, what's the think tank from Netherlands, <laughs> which is represented by Alex Klimburg and East West Institute from the United States. So now to our panel. We have five great minds. We have five great personalities. We have five exceptional experts who are true inspiration to all of us. So I would like to introduce them. I will start with Jeff, who's on my left. Jeff Moss is the founder and CEO of the DEF CON Hacker Conference and founder of the Black Hat Briefings. Lata Reddy is co-chair of the commission, is former diplomat, ambassador, and deputy national security advisor of India. Michael Chertov, also co-chair of the commission, is, I think, best known as the former Secretary of Homeland Security. And sec security. Homeland Security. Karl Bildt, in Estonia, he doesn't need introduction, but, but as we have international audience here. <laughs> former Prime Minister, Foreign Minister of uh, Sweden, and also Chair of the Global Commission on Internet Governance. And last, but definitely not least, Wolfgang Kleinwachter, director of the ICANN board and the special ambassador of the Net Mundial Initiative, Professor Emeritus from the University of Aarhus. So to start with, I'll ask the same question from all of you. You're busy people. You have a lot to do. Why are you on this commission? Why did you agree to dedicate some of your time to the future of internet cyber stability. What do you expect from the commission? And where do you see your personal part in the work of the commission? So let's start with Jeff. <laughs> okay, a small question there. <laughs> um, and and, and yeah. please, please keep within half an hour. Oh, for each, <laughs> each one of us. No, I think, um, well, I was honored to be asked to join. And I think I was going through my ICANN uh, withdrawal. I was previously the chief security officer at ICANN. And that gave me a very global perspective uh, from an internet governance view, um, which aligned with sort of my views of running conferences where the, the world essentially is your, your base. The internet is, is global. And I've always had a very global view when it comes to, to connectivity. And at ICANN, I got to see how that played out on an internet governance scale. And so the, the commission here, I think, allows me to focus not on all the issues globally, but now we're focused on uh, things related to just the stability uh, and resiliency. And that aligned a lot with what uh, our, my role at ICANN was, which was the stability, security, and resiliency of the Internet's identifiers. Here it's at a much, I, I get a bigger playing field. So I really appreciated that. And, uh, and I also think there's sort of two things going on here. One is we, we talk about the technical stability of the Internet, and we can talk about peering agreements and acceptable use policies and BGP and DNS and the technical things. But there's also this political side, the normative discussion, and the two have to work in concert. We're not going to technical, through technical means, we're not going to solve any of these, these problems unless there's a, sort of a political will and, a, and a, a, a group consensus on how we're going to do this. Uh, and so that's one of the big attractions to me. The other one is I think an independent body like this um, full of independent experts that we can provide sort of speak truth to power in the sense that we can say things to governments that maybe government, uh, uniquely uh, U.S. government or Canadian government, they wouldn't say. And we can come up with recommendations that have been backed by research. And a lot of other commissions don't have a research component, and, and we do. 
So there's a lot of things I think that I'm looking forward to producing that haven't been done before. Uh, and that, that gets me excited. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And uh, Lata, your perspective? Well, my perspective is, um, firstly, I have to say something that may sound naive, but I truly love the internet. I think it transformed my life. I'm sure it transformed all your lives. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful medium of communication. And uh, anything that I can do to keep that safe, uh, anything or safer, because there's no absolute safe in uh, internet. Um, you know, I felt, one, one, I felt impelled to do that. Second day, I was going through very bad withdrawal symptoms <laughs> See, <I'm> from, the, <laughs> from the Global Commission on Internet Governance under the chairmanship of Carl Bildt, which we had just completed. So I was delighted at the thought of joining another multi-stakeholder group with representatives from different sections of society. And I knew that building on the work of the Built Commission, this new commission could achieve even, uh, even more. And I was, like Jeff, I was honored to be asked. I was happy to be uh, a part of it. And um, I think what I bring to it is perhaps my own experience in India, which is a unique country. We have close to 500 million connected people now in India. Mm -hmm. which makes us the second largest user of the internet in the world. Uh, but we have 800 million unconnected people. Even if you discount the fact that maybe a lot of them are infants who can't really <laughs> use the internet, I would still say we need to put another 500 million people online. And this debate of how do we connect the unconnected for me is a very important one. And how do we preserve uh, innovation? How do we keep the internet open, and yet at the same time assuage all the fears about safety on the internet. Uh, and it's very difficult when you start bringing in large numbers of people who perhaps lack the uh, sophisticated thinking to understand the dangers they run on the, uh, on the internet. So I think these kind of issues are what impelled me personally. And um, finally, uh, what do I expect the Commission to do? Uh, I expect us to improve understanding between different stakeholder groups by our frank discussions, and I hope our equally frank recommendations. Um, Marina has told us, as chairperson, and I completely agree with her, that we need to not just uh, come out with one report at the very end of our Commission, which is expected to last for three years, but to keep up a steady flow of information and to engage with policymakers, with different groups, right through the period of this commission. Uh, secondly, I think we need to influence policymakers in governments, in private sector, in academia, in civil society, to perhaps give them some suggestions of how we can move in the right direction to preserve this medium that we all love and treasure. And finally, uh, I think one of our main aims should be to help to create, solidify, and implement norms that will work, rules of the road that will work. And uh, you know, to essentially point out that unless we achieve this, the internet is in very grave danger. So I believe our commission has a mission, it has a vision, and I'm committed to both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lata. Michael. <clears throat> well, thank you, Marina, and thank you to the conference for hosting us. Um, you know, I come to this uh, not as a technical person, but really having had the background, as you said, of Secretary of Homeland Security, um, where I dealt with the internet, frankly, mostly from a security standpoint, and also having experience as part of the intelligence community, so uh, with experience in terms of some of what can be done from an intelligence collection standpoint, both for good or for ill, um, online. I was also... Um, prosecutor for many years. I was the head of the criminal division, and part of my responsibility involved investigating and prosecuting people who committed crimes over the internet. That became more of an issue. I'm an alumnus of the uh, Built Commission, um, and I currently work in, in the private sector with a lot of tech companies, so I've gotten the opportunity to see some of these issues from their standpoint. W why am I... Um, 
part of this, well, first of all, it's a tremendous group of people to be working with, and I feel honored to have been included uh, because you really have a tremendously broad range of perspectives and experiences, and uh, frankly, I hope to learn a lot as well as make a contribution uh, because I think part of the value of an enterprise like this is it broadens your, your perspective. Um, I also think it's important for Americans, particularly at this moment, to reaffirm the fact that we do recognize we are part of a planet, we're part of a world, and we want to both contribute and take account of the perspectives of our co-inhabitants on planet Earth. And I think nothing is more um, significant from a, a global standpoint than the internet. I liken the internet in some ways to the way the sea was viewed over the last thousand or two thousand years of human history. It is the great global commons. Uh, if we all work together and respect each other's rights and obligations, the sea can be a tremendous resource for travel, for trade, for fishing. If we all decide we're going to hunker down and only serve our own self-interest, we would rapidly spoil the value of the sea. And I think it's very similar for the internet. Uh, that the, the, the real secret sauce, the real value proposition is in fact the global interconnectivity. And if we break it, we will have destroyed what the real value is to each of us individually and to each of our, our individual nations. Um, in terms of what I, I hope we are able to pursue, um, first of all, I do think <clears throat> getting some good research into the technical and, and uh, geopolitical foundations of a lot of these issues is very valuable. It's very easy to have an opinion uh, without facts, but it's more important to have an opinion based on facts. And I think we uh, will both enlighten ourselves and enlighten uh, observers if we can do some research. The other thing which I guess I've learned over time in looking at, at a whole bunch of issues, and I think it's true with respect to the internet, is in the end, most of these fundamental questions boil down to governance. What are the policies that regulate the people and the technologies that we rely upon? Although technical expertise and capability is part of the mix, it is not actually the solution. It has to operate within a framework of governance, policy, how we view people's rights, how we view their obligations. And I think that we have the opportunity as we look at stability in a very broad sense to talk about what are the kinds of methods of governance that take advantage of the technology, but that also make sure the technology is subordinated to uh, human interests and all of our rights and obligations. Thank, thank you, Michael, for that. Carl. I think all of the wise things have already been said. <laughs> no. um, but I think, I mean, I'm. I'm here because, I mean, first, all it's a pleasure to work with Marina, all it's a pleasure to go to Tallinn, haven't been here for two weeks. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, but primarily because these issues are enormously both important and difficult. That has to be said. Uh, probably the most important and difficult issues that we have to deal with on the globe today. Uh, I was scheduled originally not to be in Tallinn, but to be in Singapore today where we have the beginning of the Shangri-La Dialogue, and I should have been discussing sort of South China Sea, North Korea nukes, and all of those things. So that's easy by comparison. If we look, and less important, I would even say, that the issues that we're dealing with here. I happen to believe that we are in the final phase of the industrial age, and the beginning of the digital age. And we are in technological terms, we are to make that comparison, we are with the second generation steam engine at the moment, and the industrial age didn't end with the second generation steam engine. It went on for centuries and profoundly transformed every single aspect of human development. That's gonna happen here as well. Uh, but how much and in which direction is difficult to know. Where are we gonna be in 10 years? I don't know. 10 years ago, that was when the first smartphone appeared 10 years ago. And now we have a situation where I would say within five years, <coughs> virtually every young, at least boy in the world, is going to have a smartphone. Girls, nearly all of them as well. 90% of the population of the world will be covered by mobile broadband networks with a better capacity than we have in most of Europe today. It is a truly revolutionary, truly disruptive technology. 
Now, there are technological implications. Many of you know more <coughs> about them than I do. There are political ones that we are struggling with. There are economic ones that are profound. There are social ones that we are beginning to start to understand. But all. So I think commissions like this, <coughs> where you bring together, we bring together different experiences to try to take steps ahead in order to get the rules, the regulations, the standards, the frameworks for this emerging digital age is very important indeed. Some of us spent two years together on some of these issues, uh, but I think what we learned, uh, at least what I learned during that particular journey, was that we started with a set of issues, which we thought were the most important ones. Uh, whether we sorted them out or not, we can discuss, but they sort of started to fade, and suddenly we had other issues that are emerging. And that, I think, is going to be what we'll see here as well. It's such a rapidly evolving technological space with profoundly difficult political, social, and economic implications uh, that I think commissions of this sort are highly important in trying to integrate the different perspectives, uh, trying to speak, uh, I wouldn't say truth to power, uh, but I would say speak uh, something that is possible for normal people to comprehend and understand to power. Uh, because there's been a profound sort of clash, not clash, but difficulty of understanding because a tech community that speaks a language that for most human beings uh, is foreign. And, and to bridge those particular gaps so that policymakers can start to deal rationally with issues that are going to be profoundly important for the way in which our society has developed in decades, uh, not as Speak about centuries ahead. So, Marina, we expect you to <coughs> guide us in sorting out all of this. No, 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 no. All of us. <laughs> Carl, thank you. Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, somebody has said, I think it was yesterday, we have moved from a cold war to a cold war. And uh, while this is probably not precise, but it's a good illustration where we are now, that um, the internet is now in the center of global politics. There is no security without cybersecurity. Our economy is a digital economy, and our individual rights we have in the Human Rights Declaration are the same offline and online. There is no difference. So it means everything is now cyber, everything is digital, everything is code. Um, can we learn something from the Cold War to manage the Cold War? Um, you know, uh, in the 1960s, I was a teenager. This was the peak time of the Cold War. I was 14 years old when the Berlin Wall was erected. We had the Cuba crisis in 1963. There was war in the Middle East, the Vietnam War. In 1968, Soviet tanks were in Czechoslovakia. So this was a complicated time. But at the same time, some people said, OK, should we continue with the nuclear arms race, or should we do something to stop this? So in 1963, we had the first a test ban, a nuclear test ban treaty. In 1968, we had the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, we had the Berlin Agreement in 1971, and this paved the way for the Helsinki a conference in 1975, which guaranteed, at least for Europe, a stable face for detente, for cooperation, and for peace, and also paved the way for the, the transformation we saw then in the early 1990s. So, you know, can we learn something from the, for the uh, uh, digital world now? Can we turn the Cold War into a digital detente? I think our uh, commission has to deliver the report until the year 2020, and my hope is that the commission will make some good recommendations so that the 2020s become a decade of a digital detente. Uh, Wolfgang, thank you. Thank you all for your introductory statements, and, and as you can hear, uh, they are ambitious. I think all the commissioners and the commission as whole is very ambitious. Those people don't have time to waste. 
Once they are in, they want to discuss, but they also they are committed and they want to see results. We have time to discuss among ourselves. So I don't want to keep the discussion only on the podium here. And if there are any questions, any interventions from the audience, please take advantage of all the people on the stage, of the commissioners in the audience, and we'll be happy to hear from you, and they'll be happy to answer the questions. But before we go to that, uh, I like very much what Carl said, and everybody said, how rapid are the recent developments. At the beginning of this week, I was in Helsinki, where there was their first uh, cyber conference. I listened to one of the chief officers from Nokia, who, together with Uri Rosenthal, we were there, uh, another commissioner from uh, Netherlands, former foreign minister of Netherlands. And we listened to a great speech there where the rapid developments of today were compared to a pool, which is of the side of a stadium. If we imagine a pool of the side of the stadium, which is filled with water, first minute, one drop, second minute, two drops, third minute, four drops, and we continue. So the pool will be filled in about 45 minutes. On the 44th minute, mm -hmm. it's half full. Mm -hmm. But we have the feelings we have lots of time. It took 44 minutes to come to the full, to the half full of the pool. And we don't realize that it takes only one more minute to fill it completely. So that is the speed of the develop development taking place at the moment. And we have to be, we have to be able to follow and to be ahead of the developments. Before I open to the audience uh, and to, to other commissioners, I still have one question to ask from all of you. I'll start with Lata. Uh, look, at the, look at our panel. We heard people from Europe. We heard people from North America. But how do you feel? Are we listening enough? Are we hearing what people from other regions are saying? You mentioned interesting facts about India. Do you feel that we pay enough attention to other players, regional players in the field? Do we listen, for example, to India? Do we know really what's happening there? Um, I would say, you know, that you are listening or the world is listening more than it was. But it's not listening enough. Because I think a lot of people don't pay attention to the fact that the largest number of internet users in the world is in China. The second largest number, as I mentioned, is in India. And there's a whole continent, Africa, where another very large group of users is going to come on the internet. And the needs, the <laughs> capability, the, the purchasing power of those markets is going to be very uh, different. Uh, <coughs> and I think while at least some attention is paid to India and to China, uh, I don't think much is paid at all to smaller countries in Asia and uh, Africa and their requirements. I think to a limited extent, the same is true of uh, South America, Latin America. Again, I don't think enough uh, focus on these areas. And essentially, you know, there is a very transatlantic mindset on most security issues, including on, on cybersecurity and on techno technology uh, issues. So, you know, yesterday Wolfgang said something very interesting. He said that Kofi Annan had said that we need uh, innovation in policy making and not just innovation in technology. And maybe, Marina, what I think is that the innovation in policy making should come when we really develop a global view and we start looking into the future. This panel is supposed to be looking at the future of the internet. So look at the future users. What languages are they going to be using? Is Mandarin going to be more important than, than English as the language of the internet? 
are India's 22 languages, and I apologize on behalf of my country for introducing 22 <laughs> languages. But uh, are India's 22 languages going to be important in the future? Because don't forget, each of these languages is spoken by anything from 50 to 100 million people. So these are not small languages. You know, these are highly developed languages. They're not dialects. And if you really want internet, if you really want the benefits of computer technology to reach all people in India, you would have to develop content in all these uh, languages. So, you know, there are, there are all these issues. And I mentioned purchasing power right at the beginning. Uh, India today, just today I read that India has introduced one GB of internet power at the rate of 33 American cents. This is per month to the average user. So we've done it in India. We brought down the price levels uh, to manageable uh, amounts. You can also get 4G. Uh, we're waiting for 5G to arrive, but we can already get 4G. But you pay more for 4G, but there's also 1G available for people who need it for very basic functions. So should we be looking at this in innovation of technology? And so I think there, there should be more attention paid. Uh, the, the Built Commission report, uh, Carl, you'll remember, we had a huge section on inclusion. Mm -hmm. And though we, did, we were not all of the same mind at the beginning of our discussions, mm -hmm. we realized that inclusion was very, very important in order to uh, ensure universal access to this wonderful uh, medium. Uh, I've seen what an empowering tool it is in development. That's why it, it's talked about in term of sustainable development goals. So I think it can only help the world if we begin to look at areas like Asia and Africa in a new way, as harbingers of the future rather than recipients of aid, as people who are going to shape the future rather than as people who need to be helped. So I'll leave it at that. Mm. Thank you a lot for that. And I hope that maybe at the later stage, I'll be able to also bring in our commissioners from Japan, from China, from Singapore, who are also sitting here at the conference. But just now, uh, Michael, when we think about what the Commission should accomplish, we are thinking very much about norms. Uh, yesterday, we talked about international law. Our Commission will not be able, it's not our task, to write new laws, to interpret laws, to apply laws. This can be done only by states. What we can do, we, we can and we have to think about new norms, which are political norms, not legally binding, but political. I'm a lawyer, I understand the difference between legal norms and political norms, and I would argue that even political norms are sometimes very important, because uh, via political norms, states commit <coughs> themselves to a certain behavior. What we are also hearing is that international community wants to see more norms on protection of critical infra. How do you see, in what direction should we go, and let's say more specifically, maybe protection of uh, uh, financial systems globally? Well, first of all, Marina, I, I agree. Um, obviously, we're not writing laws. Um, what we can hope to do is debate and make some suggestions about what norms might be and then those ultimately can be adopted through state practice or even more formally uh, through something else. And, and look, I mean, I think we need to be clear-eyed about norms. Uh, norms, even when they become part of international law, are not a guarantee of good behavior. I mean, if you look at the, what's occurred in Syria over the last year, there are norms against chemical warfare and, and deliberately killing civilians, and those norms are not obviously being honored in Syria. But nevertheless, norms are important, <clears throat> and they do guide conduct for a lot of nations, and they also mean that when someone violates a norm, there are certain things you can do to respond to that. So in this case, I, I come back to my point about the global commons. Um, if we are going to get the real value of the internet as a global, interconnected uh, uh, piece of infrastructure, we've got to have rules of the road that make sure we have trust. And frankly, when the internet was created, you know, and originally began as an effort to develop resilient communications among academics and officials. 
trust was not really thought about explicitly because everybody knew everybody else. And now the big challenge we have is trust. How do we know that uh, when we engage in transactions or move money or do any one of a number of different things, uh, someone is not gonna take advantage of us and exploit us? So I think building uh, trust is an important element of what we can do to, to promote the internet. I also think we need to be realistic about building norms. Um, you know, this is not a case of designing some grand scheme. Uh, as, as Lata pointed out, we're dealing with a lot of different cultures in a lot of different countries, and frankly, with some antagonistic players. Um, so to me, identifying norms where we can build trust incrementally uh, in areas that I think most actors would agree <clears throat> we ought to preserve trust and we ought to preserve uh, the uh, um, accuracy and reliability of the internet, I think that's a good way to begin the process of developing uh, rules of the road and an international regime for the internet. And it also builds trust among countries. So I picked the financial sector because I think, it, at least in the discussions I've had, uh, well, pretty much all the major nation states and all the major players in the internet economy understand the importance of maintaining the integrity of the financial system. In 2008, we saw what happened when there was a real crisis of trust in our global financial system, and that cost an awful lot of money and it caused an awful lot of pain to people. And if we were to have a crisis of trust in the financial system because of the internet, I think it would be worse. So to me, this is an area we can build trust among all those actors, even if we disagree fundamentally about a lot of what goes on in the world, we can build some trust, we can build some norms, we can actually begin to protect uh, the sanctity of an important global institution, and along the way we may learn that it is possible to work together. So I think this is an area where we can start with the financial system, we can then deal with issues like air traffic uh, control systems, but I think we can make some progress. Uh, thank you, Michael, on that, and I can't agree more. From national Estonian national perspective, I can say that when we when we were but when I was participating in the work of the previous UNGG UN Group of Governmental Experts, we approached the work in the in the United Nations in a pragmatic way. We were ambitious, but we were pragmatic. So we decided to bring to the discussion something that we thought is important for all governments. We learned from our practice of 2007, when our banks were attacked mainly. We approached our banking system, financial system here in Estonia and asked them, what do you want us, us MFA, us government, to raise on international level? And that was exactly, they said, if you can, please bring the norm, not attacking financial systems in peacetime. So we did in 2013, and there was much of sympathy around the table. In the corridors, almost everybody said, that's the right thing to do. But we couldn't agree. Hmm. So we're finishing the work of the next GG. The final meeting will be in a couple of weeks in New York. And still I feel that we will not be able to agree on that. Although, if you talk to countries separately, everybody says, that's the backbone of economy. Hmm. We have to protect that. So if we can't do it in the United Nations, I'm sure we'll do it in the Commission and we'll approach states again. Uh, Jeff, your background mm -hmm. is at the intersection of hacking, mm -hmm. professional cybersecurity, internet governance, coming from technical community. Mm. How do you feel, how much is technical community today <coughs> involved, and how much is technical community listened to when we talk about cyber stability, cyber security? Is your voice heard? Yeah, um, well, it's heard, but it's, I, it's a challenge, I think, because for the longest period of time, the technical community spoke amongst themselves of these issues, and we would complain to each other about these issues, and we'd complain to, say, a, a manager, a, a vice president, but n it was not taken seriously, I think, partially because um, it was very abstract, and you would articulate some risk, and it was a risk that a business person, a government, uh, uh, official could not, it wasn't tangible, and they couldn't connect it to anything that had happened to them personally in their life, and so it was very abstract. And then, a, then the real world 
came along. Um, and the, for me, the, the big uh, animating force was when Google came out publicly and said, uh, we believe that China has been attacking our system. And then all of a sudden, when the CEO of a large company says this, all of a sudden now it's real. Now all of a sudden all the other CEOs are talking about it. And I remember uh, I was talking to a reporter um, and they were asking me about this attacks. And I, I remember saying, oh, well, yes, nation states attack each other and they do it for various re means. And at the end I realized I said a lot. And that reporter could make me look like a really smart person or an idiot. And so I went back and I Googled Jeff Moss, China, you know, hacks. And I got an article and I was thinking, that was, a, that was pretty reasonable. I came across really, and that article was from a decade earlier. <laughs> so I've been saying the same thing for like a decade. <laughs> the only difference now was that Google's saying it out loud. Now it's real. So now we have an opportunity in the technical community to be heard in government and in senior levels of, of uh, companies. Um, so that's a risk and an opportunity. I really like the opportunity because now I'm actually speaking to the people who can make these decisions. But I think we only get this opportunity once or twice. If we misrepresent the risks, if we pretend that the world's going to end at, you know, IPv6, extensible headers are going to destroy the planet, we're going to miss the opportunity. So what we don't have are people who are both very technical and can talk policy or can talk norms or can talk arms control. And so we're at this dangerous place where there's a lot of demand for technical people to be included in the debate and there's not enough people that can do both. Um, so why can't they do both? Do we speak different languages? Well, you speak different languages oh, yeah. and it's interesting because each phrase or, or term of art um, has a different meaning. So an attack in cyberspace uh, is, is different than maybe an attack politically or an attack militarily. Um, and the other thing I worry about, I've spoken about this earlier, is uh, previously, is the language that's now used is very military oriented. Um, and it's informing the in internet side of things. And so it's, it's a cyber war. It's a, you know, the, a cyber kill chain. Um, they're digital bullets. It's really frustrating because um, it doesn't work the same way between physical, kinetic, and, and internet. And so I think we're, we're unintentionally creating a mindset where we're thinking militaristically over a lot of these issues where we don't need to, to go that way. Um, and it inf if you just, just read the literature, just read how uh, people talk about uh, internet security and it's starting to sound very military. So we have to learn each other's languages. I, I think we do. And then, then the people you pick as those translators uh, are in a, a real position of inf influence. Um, and so those people will become very critical. Now, at some point, like I've watched on, uh, in Washington, D.C., the staffers are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Ten years from now, um, they'll be very informed. Um, but we're in this fragile period right now where a little bit of knowledge is dangerous, and we need to get through that and make sure that all the people are, are informed or have access to the information. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And Wolfgang, you're so well known for your fields of expertise, transborder data flow, and internet governance, but you are also known as a very strong supporter of multi-stakeholder approach. Why? Why is it important in internet governance? Why is it important <coughs> for cybersecurity, cyber stability? I think Jeff made a good point just now, uh, arguing, you know, governments didn't listen to us 10 years ago, now they are listening. Uh, and Lata already quoted Kofi Annan, when he gave a speech in the first meeting of the United Nations Working Group on Internet Governance and called for um, policy innovation. He, his argument was, you know, the Internet is a technological innovation. We have now already Web 3.0, 4.0, but we have still policy 1.0. And we, you know, doing things like in the 20th century, in the 21st century, and this will not be enough. I think the uh, lesson from the United Nations World Summit on the Information Society, the VISIS, was that more and more uh, governments and also other stakeholders realized nobody can manage it alone. So uh, that means uh, while 
the United States uh, government in Geneva was arguing for private sector leadership. China was countering it, asking for governmental leadership. The recommendation from the um, Working Group on Internet Governance was the Internet does not need a leader. It needs the collaboration of all stakeholders in their respective roles. The private sector cannot substitute the government. And the civil society cannot substitute the private sector. And the technical community cannot substitute the private sector. So that means all the stakeholders have a special role to play, and we will be able to manage the issues and to find solutions only if the various stakeholders work hand in hand. So, and this needs a new political culture of collaboration, a new form of mutual respect. It's not a hierarchical uh, system, you know, where somebody on the top makes a decision and the others have to implement the decision. This has to be uh, find out in bottom-up processes, which has to be open and transparent. In so far, the um, slogan of the Internet Engineering Task Force, running code and rough consensus, is, is a good guideline. So that means nobody has the final solution in the first place. You need forms of dialogue. And then certainly at the end of the day, somebody has to make a decision in this multi-stakeholder model. And, uh, you know, in our system, it's mainly a national parliament which makes the decision or a government makes the decision. But it means the multi-stakeholder model does not totally undermine the sovereignty of a state, but, you know, it challenges in a certain way the government to be more open, to be more collaborative, to share at least policy development. And that's in the benefit of all sides. So certainly, you know, the Internet has led to a power shift. And a power shift needs to power struggle and then to a power redistribution. And we are in the middle of this process. So it means the power is still floating around, and the question is who gets the final decision-making power. And, you know, hopefully we can make a contribution to open the mind of all stakeholders and to say the solution is not to re-centralize power in one hand, but to decentralize power and to uh, find ways how to optimize the collaboration of the various stakeholders in their respective roles. Uh, Wolfgang, thank you. And on this point, I'm also happy to say that at the beginning of next week, we will have Eurodig in Tallinn, which you are so closely connected to. I should say godfather of Eurodig. So it's another opportunity to have the multi-stakeholder approach. So please don't leave Estonia. Stay for the weekend. <laughs> and on, the on Monday, we'll have the next cyber conference, Eurodig. Carl, taking into consideration you as former foreign minister, former Prime Minister, I think it would be fair to ask from you about international security. And how do you see cyber as a challenge in international security structure? Well, in, in a number of different ways. Just start by making the side comment on the different languages, and Volker mentioned the mm. IETF. It reminds me of the fact that I think 15 years ago someone dragged me into a meeting of the IETF. <laughs> um, and that was an interesting experience. I, I think they spoke English, uh, <laughs> because when, when, they announced it was time for, when they announced it was time for coffee, I did understand what they said. But that was the end of it. I mean, it was really different languages. And to bridge that particular gap, to make technology, or at least part of it, understandable for the policy community is, is, is interesting uh, or important. Then, also following something Wolfgang said, the sort of Cold War and whatever, and detente and digital or whatever, we should be aware of the fact that there are philosophical differences here that are important. Um, in the old world, the Cold War, there were two superpowers that were equipped with nuclear weapons, but there was an element of detente between them which was good in the sense that it prevented a nuclear war. In today's world, uh, I'm not saying this only to flatter, but I think it's an element of truth. There are two cyber powers uh, with different philosophies. One is Estonian, another one is China. And uh, there's a size difference between them. But in the digital world, size doesn't matter. Um, it, and the way in which you approach these issues long term 
is going to be very important. Um, one philosophy is, I think the Chinese term is internet sovereignty that they want to have, which is essentially state control as much as possible of the entire thing. Borders and states are going to be as important in the digital world as they would like it to be in the physical world. While the other approach is the more borderless, uh, freedom online uh, philosophy. And uh, we shouldn't sort of forget that difference that is there. At the same time, as we have an interest in living in the same world, developing the same economy, developing the same possibilities for human beings, be that in Tartu or, or Chengdu, uh, to be able to develop. Um, and that, I think, is important. And that leads also to the conclusion, I think, that yes, multi-stakeholder, a web of governance. Uh, it leads also to the philosophy, or I think the approach that I don't think there's a big bang solution. Uh, hopefully not, by the way, because big bangs tends to be big bangs, mm -hmm. uh, but more an incremental. Uh, we need to move this forward step by step in area after area, seeing where we can get agreement, where we can move things together, understanding that for the time being there are also differences that are difficult to bridge and being clear about those differences. And that, that's a sort of a difficult balancing thing at times, but should certainly not be, be forgotten. Uh, thank you, Carl. And there is one person I would like to bring into our discussion, that is, Ur, uh, that is Uri, Uri Rosenthal, who is special representative to our commission, who is representing the London process, who is former Dutch foreign minister, who is known as one of the founding fathers of the Freedom Online Coalition. Mm. We tried to get all 25 commissioners on, on the stage. <laughs> Saikon refused. So that's why I have to pick some and, and also invite them to share their views. Uri, if you please could. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Marina. And uh, let me say that uh, with you, I was struck by this uh, story by the CEO of Nokia on this pool. 44 minutes half full, 45th minute full. Mm -hmm. And if we take that seriously, what are we, what are we seeing in the offing mm -hmm. for the coming years? And Carl was talking about it. We are walking now around with iPads and perhaps in five years time, we have only the, the phone or some other smart gadget to use. So what's in the offing? I, I would like to, to stress, uh, that when we talk about internet and ICT, uh, my government, the Dutch government, has from the very beginning, also when we started the Freedom Online Coalition, worked with a sort of triangle, which was to balance three corners. One is, of course, the open and free internet, and ICT as an open channel. Secondly, safety and security. Third, economic growth and social development. That's so important. And I would say that uh, Carl has uh, pinpointed very correctly the fact that on the one hand, we are facing countries where the state and government says that the internet is mine, is, is my possession, is my asset. Other countries saying that we are indeed going for borderless communication, etc., And Freedom Online is on that, is on that uh, road. Now, I think that it's of great importance that we will get to a sort of connection between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is why I am very um, keen on having as many countries and people on board for the efforts we are, uh, we are trying to pursue. That's my main, as main message. And the second one is, and you already addressed it, Marina, and we addressed it also in the beginning of this week in Finland, uh, we should understand that when we talk global commission, it is really global. Mm -hmm. It is global. And we have so much to, we should do away with the obsolete notion of donor-receptor relations. That is old times. 
We have to learn on the western part of the world, we have to learn so much from the global south. We are going into, new, uh, into a new era, which is really an era of a global effort. Thank you. Uh, Uri, thank you so much. And thank you so much for mentioning that <coughs> global and geographical representation. I would say that we are proud to have commissioners from Berkeley to Beijing. So if I might invite another person to say, I would like, to, China was mentioned several times, and we are really happy to have Professor Li Xiaodong among us, who is a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, very well known in China. So if you, if you will, what are your expectations? Where do you stand on the commission? And, and uh, <laughs> need, uh, did I say that you are our commissioner? No. Yes, <laughs> yes, he's our commissioner. He's one of us. Yeah. I uh, just as a commission that I should speak English. Maybe it's English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I, I used, used to working at, at ICANN and at ETF, and also I strong, strongly support the modesty of models for the internet governance. And also, I think that there is uh, some, some kind of little bit difference for the cybersecurity issues. For this commission, there is a big task for us to achieve. Uh, I want to mention two points. One is, you know, uh, if we only consider about the modest stakeholders, maybe we cannot avoid the, the function for the government because there's so many security issues need to be dealt with by the government or lead by the government. Because, you know, if someday some hikers, which is not worked hard by the government, was attack another country, how to deal with that? Maybe, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Use DevCon. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's other government. I think we need some collaboration between the government with the other uh, stakeholder or communities. And uh, another point I want to mention that the cost benefit model, because in the traditional security, you know, the, for the cost benefit model is very, very useful. Because if you have a very high cost, uh, if you want to get some benefit, you will lose that. But in the, in the internet area, in the cybersecurity area, you, you can use a very lower cost to get a very large benefit. You know, that's, that means that the tradi traditional philosophy for the security cannot be used in the cybersecurity area. So I think it's a, for, for this commission, I'm very happy to be invited in the, into this commission to be commissioner. So I want to contribute my knowledge, but it's a big, big headache for myself. <laughs> I, I think we, we, we can achieve something in this only three years. It's a very, very ambitious target for that. But I want to encourage every commissioner and all, also every attendance here and everybody who get involved in the security issues, we need to work together. I, I, I think it's, a, it's very, many, very, very uh, important that we need uh, collaboration, collaboration between government with other stakeholders and also the collaboration among different kind of stakeholders, especially for the technical community, because the internet is rely on the technology very much, how to make sure that we can have a wonderful solution which can be supported strongly by the technical solution is very, very important. We cannot only define policy which means nothing without the technologies. Thank you, it's just my, my comment. Thank you, thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, and I would like to open the floor for questions remarks, comments, and I see already a couple of hands, please. And please introduce yourself. Yeah, Andreas Lindenblatt, uh, CEO of Solution, a small company in Germany. Um, I'm positively surprised about the quality of this um, commission. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and, the, and, and, and well. you've seen only the small part of it. <laughs> really fantastic. But nevertheless, um, yeah. You're talking about uh, rules, you're talking about laws, about states. The internet is um, still built on, on RFCs, on requests for comments. That's no fixed rules. And um, why do you think that you really will make a difference if um, there is no authority in the internet? And I don't think there will be an authority in the internet, even if the states are trying to do this. Why do you think you will succeed? Well. Thank you for that question. I think we'll take also the second one, and then uh, commissioners will have can uh, reflect on that. Yes, please. 
Hi, uh, my name is Dennis Boeders. I work for the Netherlands uh, uh, Scientific Council of Government Policy. <coughs> we published a report in 2015 called The Public Core of the Internet. Um, we basically argue, I'm sort of uh, uh, commenting also on, on your experiences in the UNGG for arguing for, for sort of a non-interference with the financial system. In this report we argue there is, there is a subset of core protocols and core infrastructure that can be considered a global public good that should not be interfered with by states basically. That position has by now been uh, overtaken uh, by the Dutch MFA, so they're, they're, they're pushing for that. And I was wondering if you would like to comment on whether this could be uh, uh, something that would be uh, of use in your work in the commission mm -hmm. and, and how that would play out in your commission because like the previous speaker, I like the, the bandwidth that the commission has. Uh, yesterday there was another panel that would increase the bandwidth even further because there would be much more the security minded people there. So I think that's going to be a tremendous uh, forum uh, for discussing something like this. I would like to hear uh, a comment on that. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you for the questions. So two questions. Will the internet survive without rules? Saying that there are no rules, which I don't agree to. And second question, should we discuss core infrastructure during our deliberations? Who would like to start? Wolfgang, please. Uh, then Paul. You know, the question of there is no central authority in the internet, I think it's well known. But on the other hand, in the definition on internet governance, which was adopted by the United Nations World Summit on the Information Society, uh, we have a differentiation between the evolution and the use of the internet. So this means uh, what you refer to the RFC are related to the evolution of the internet. These are more or less the technical norms. The use of the internet is a different story. Uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle, who chairs now an uh, interesting project on jurisdiction and the internet, also a former ICANN director, uh, differentiated between the governance of the internet and governance on the internet. This is interlinked, so that means you cannot separate anymore the technical from the political regulation, but these are two different shoes. And in so far, you know, this has to go hand in hand in a certain way, and we have to find something like an interesting cohabitation or something like that, where, you know, you have political decisions made probably in the traditional way, which are aware about the technical implications and vice versa, so that the code makers understand what the lawmakers are doing. So that means the challenge is to bring code makers and lawmakers, uh, not to harmonize them, but to bring them in a new quality of interaction so that they understand better what the others are doing. This, we are moving from simple structures to complex structures, and this is one of the complexity we have to deal with. You cannot escape from this complexity. You have just to acknowledge this. Call, please. And very briefly, I mean, your question was really sort of can, can it work without an authority or whatever. I, I would argue I would be against a authority, but I'm in favor of very many authorities. There are numerous authorities that have sort of responsibility for governance of the different parts of the net off the net and on the net even more. And, and then it's the interplay between these different authorities, institutions, and norms that's important. Second question, the core internet. Um, in our commission, we had a debate about that. Uh, whether we managed to resolve it, I'm not quite certain. Uh, but I think we need to take it up, because I, I would be of the opinion that one should have make that sort of a no-go area. At the same time, I know cases where states have been interfering and done it for reasons that I can understand. Uh, but uh, that's a question of, that's as difficult, I would say, as another issue, which is my favorite difficult issue that we need to, that's the encryption issue, yeah. uh, which is also equally difficult, where in my opinion, the, the number one important commodity in the world today is data. Accordingly, the protection of the data, the integrity of the data, is fundamental. It's probably the fundamental security issue of our societies. How do you protect the data? You protect it with encryption. Are there reasons to go into encryption by states now and then to deal with bad actors? Yes, there are. But here you need to really find a balance. Um, so these are 
to extremely difficult issues where I would hope that it would be possible to find a solid global consensus, but we are cer certainly not there. Uh, thank you, Carl. Anybody else from the Lata, please? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I don't entirely agree that because you've never had rules in an area like the internet, that you should never have rules. If the same had been true, we would not have had the Geneva Convention or the Vienna Convention. God knows how many more world wars there would have, uh, would have been. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with Carl that you can't have a agreement, not for something as complex as the... <coughs> Uh, as the uh, internet, but perhaps, um, I mean, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Professor Joseph Nye's uh, regime complex, where he talks about the fact that there is a system of internet governance mm -hmm. made up of several organizations in their individual capacities who do govern the internet. Um, but I think it's very complex, as has already been said by my fellow panelists, but I do think we owe it to ourselves and to the future of internet to try to build some rules of the road, some norms that have large, if not universal, consensus behind them. On the second point, on the core of the internet, I think the real issue is, you know, the debate which I've heard in several forums, including our own, is that critical information infrastructure protection uh, can be two things. The critical information infrastructure can cover physical critical infrastructure, you know, things like power grids, things like uh, uh, air traffic, and so on. But it can also cover the core of the internet, you know. And I think um, if we are going to look at all at a norm which will agree that critical information infrastructures are out of bounds for attacks, we need to consider these two aspects separately. You know, the core of the internet, mm -hmm. if we want to preserve the internet, mm -hmm. the core of the internet has to be a no-go area. The physical infrastructure uh, governed by the internet is a different aspect because obviously there's a question of is it sacrosanct in wartime? Is it sacrosanct in peacetime? Can we make it sacrosanct at all? Definitely. Thank you, Lotta and uh, Jeff. Um, I have a sort of two observations. Unfortunately, I don't have any solutions. Um, I'm doing what they call in DC, I'm admiring the problem right now. <laughs> so let me admire uh, two parts. Uh, on, the, on the first one, um, Mr. Chertoff was talking earlier, he referenced um, sort of the global commons nature of the internet. And this really has always resonated with me. Um, and so when you're talking sort of global commons problems, you get into this sociological set of problems called social dilemmas, if anybody's looked into social dilemmas. And a part of a social dilemma, the most famous social dilemma, um, is called tragedy of the commons. And so, uh, and, and you might, another one might be called uh, community immunity or herd immunity, immunization theory, um, the free rider problem. Well. If you look at these problems, these are traditionally where governments get involved because all of the actors involved in a tragedy of the commons solution are never part of the solution. They're part of the problem, right? There's low cost to participate, high cost to solve the problem. And so if that's where we're moving in a digital commons issue, that tells me historically those problems have always been moderated um, by government involvement. So don't be surprised if you see the government get involved in global commons issues, because that's where they've always gotten involved. Um, and the second part is the, this, the core protocols. I just like to bring up that um, when I think core protocols, I'm thinking BGP and, and DNS and you know maybe some other things. Well, over the last 10 years, we've been, or the security community has been making changes to these core protocols to make them more secure. So a lot of research has been done in SBGP. Um, a lot of work has been done on DNSSEC. They're not widely deployed yet, but I could see a future 10 years from now, 15 years from now, where they become a lot more common. Well, what's happening there is we're making a trade-off. We're making a trade-off between security and resiliency. The, we're making the core protocols more secure, but we're also making them more fragile. So if something goes wrong, 
we'll be breaking things on a mass scale, but as long as they're not broken, they'll be much more secure. Right? So, so these kinds of decisions are being made in the IETF and in other bodies. That's not being debated by anybody else. This is just happening to <coughs> the global internet, not with polit uh, you know, politicians involved. There's no, the, the trade-off between those two are being judged and decided by the technical community. There's not a lot of civil other, other people in these rooms. Um, and if you look at what's happening in the world of, of the World Wide Web, we see Google making a big move toward uh, software of pinning TLS certificates to prevent these man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, I just went through my own pinning problem the other day. If you make a mistake with your certificate now, you might take yourself offline. Bing, Microsoft just took themselves offline because of a pinning problem uh, two days ago. They're doing this because they're trying to gain security, but they're doing it at the cost of, of fragility. And I just want to bring that up as an observation. Like As we move into trying to lock in the security, we're making these trade-offs. And none of us in this room are probably involved in those decisions. Michael, I, you know, I, I think Jeff raises a really important point and something that we ought to uh, view as one of the value contributions we can make in our work, which is well, you know, with, with some notable uh, exceptions, many of the people who make governmental decisions really are not particularly familiar with the technological issues. And the ability to translate um, the technological uh, issues into something that's understandable to the policymakers, I think is an important part of, of what we need to do. Otherwise you have, because I think ultimately governance decisions are about people. But if you don't understand the lay of the land, it's like taking a ship out at sea and not understanding where the reefs are and where the shallows are. I know I'm using a lot of maritime analogies, but we're here in Estonia, so it seems appropriate. <laughs> um, so I do think that, that uh, doing research into some of these critical areas and then translating it into language that can be understood by, by a more general public is a real contribution we can make. Uh, Bill, I'd like to introduce you. One of our commissioners, Bill Woodcock, to Estonians, he's known as one of our friends who came to assist in 2007 as the top security expert during, our, during, during the attacks of 2007. Yes, Bill, please. Thank you. Um, I had a question following up on Latha's earlier remarks. Uh, in internet governance, we had a period of relative quiet in the wake of the IANA transition. And a couple of months ago, that quiet ended with a uh, policy proposal, the anti-shutdown proposal, as it's been referred to. For those who uh, have not been involved in this debate, the proposal basically suggests that uh, if a government uh, intentionally shuts down the internet in their country, then the regional internet registry responsible for that country should withdraw IP addresses from that government as a punitive measure. So this is a proposal that was East African in origin, and it's been taken very seriously on the African continent. Uh, you know, essentially all governments have been engaged in this debate, a lot of public discussion. Yet in Europe, it's been essentially dismissed out of hand as uh, unrealistic and it'll never happen, um, which is possible. But how do we question our assumptions? How do we uh, engage in good <coughs> faith in a debate that other people feel is important? How do we... Um, how do we move forward uh, in a world in which all decisions are not going to be dictated by European and North American concerns? How do we look at an argument that other people believe is critical and give it its due, uh, due consideration? Bill, before I pass the microphone, uh, I'll ask the people on the stage to answer. What are your views of that? I, I really don't know. I mean, I'm... I'm a North American, and I look at this, and I think, neat idea, worthy of discussion. It's also very difficult for me to imagine it going anywhere. It's difficult for me to imagine European or North American governments 
giving this the kind of attention that African governments have. And I mean, the Zimbabwean government was one of the first governments to come out in favor of this. And I was what? quite startled. I, you know, they, they made the, their communications regulator and their communications ministry made quite an impassioned argument in favor of this policy. I had no idea where that was coming from, but <laughs> it was a good argument. It, it held water. Uh, so why are other governments not paying attention to that? Uh, let's take also another question from the gentleman in the, yeah, in the second row. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kuba Machag. I teach international law at the University of Exeter in Britain. Um, my question is, I mean, one of the most fascinating remarks thus far, and there have been many on the panel, came from Jeff Moss for me, when you said that uh, you're frustrated by the use of military language outside of the tech community. And so yesterday on the legal panel, we were actually debating how the focus has changed from the law of war paradigm, maybe to some more peacetime uh, focus on international law. And so that's epitomized, of course, by the new Tallinn manual, by the second Tallinn manual. But I was wondering if this feeling of frustration with this military discourse is something that is shared more broadly among the commissioners, which might be very interesting also given the venue of this conference, so to hear the thoughts of other commissioners on this issue. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And back to the panel. Who will start? Jeff, you were mentioned. Oh, so I guess I get my first, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that, I'll just talk briefly on it. It comes from, um, from my perspective, which was sort of the small businessman, civil society, ICANN world. When I have a problem, it's addressed in my acceptable use policy, my peering agreement. If I'm being a, a victim of a denial of service attack, I call my ISP. I don't call my military. You know, and my ISP responds, and we mitigate, and we put in filters, and the 82nd Airborne doesn't air drop in and configure the router. You know, this is all done through contractual agreements, and maybe that's because in my country, 90% of the infrastructure is owned by civil, you know, by business. So it's very, uh, what's the role of the military in that situation? Um, but when you listen to people, it's such a sexy, exciting sort of, like, everybody I know that's really smart and is into exploit development, because that's what's paying, um, they, y you want to be the tip of the spear. You want to be the cyber warrior. You don't want to be the cyber janitor, right? You want to be the cy cyber fighter pilot. You don't want to be the cyber planner person. So all the excitement and energy goes to offense. Little of it and recognition goes to defense. If I kick in your door and I take over your system, that's quantifiable. Did we succeed? Yes, no. If I'm on the defense, did we defend against the attacks? Well, maybe. Well, how many people got in? Well, we're not quite sure, right? One is very objective and measurable and action-oriented and full of imagery, and, and the other one is much more nebulous and costly, and the answers are not clear, and so the natural gravity pulls you into this action-oriented, offense-oriented, militaristic view. I don't think that's how we're going to, quote unquote, save the internet. We're not going to fight our way to a safer internet. Right? It's going to be through the other people. Um, but all the language is, you know, cyber kill chain. Anybody else on the both questions? Wolfgang, please. Uh, because Brian has raised a very delicate and slippery question. Uh, what happens, you know, if uh, now proposals are coming uh, with regard to IP addresses and uh, domain names uh, where governments have no final decision-making capacity because YANA transition is over now, all the domain name system and IP addresses are in the hand of the non-governmental bodies. And in this concrete case, I think we have authorities, we have institutions which have to discuss this in an open and transparent dialogue. It's not only Afrinik which made the proposal, we have five regional internet registries, we have the number resource organization, the NRO, which can discuss it, we have the address supporting organization, that means there are institutions there, and it's now a stress test for these institutions, how to deal with proposals which come up. There is a risk in it, because, you know, the... Um, as long as the uh, domain name system and the IP addresses are working, 
we have no problem to get in domain name or IP addresses. Governmental, governments will accept these special roles they have in the ICANN, that means only an advisory role. But this is not loved by everybody. I think just recently, four weeks ago, the uh, former uh, Russian Minister of Telecommunication, Mr. Zhekulyov, gave an interview to the BBC and said, okay, you know, before the Yana transition, we had a partner, the US government, we could blame the US government. Now this has disappeared. Where we go if we have a problem as a Russian government? And they push for a new intergovernmental oversight body, uh, probably in the ITU or elsewhere, in the United Nations Working Group on Internet uh, on Enhanced Cooperation. So that means if something goes wrong with the DNS and the IP addresses, you trigger, you will trigger a process which pull governments back in, uh, uh, in a certain <coughs> position. It will be rather difficult. And in so far, it's the responsibility of all involved stakeholders to do their homework, to be effective and to have open and transparent processes which will allow a bottom-up policy development process and will eliminate uh, proposals which are not acceptable, even if some individuals, individual groups, have arguments in favor of this. So that a rough consensus does not mean consensus. So it's a very tricky process, and uh, as I said, in my eyes, it's a stress test for the workability of the mechanism we have now with the so-called empowered community. So <clears throat> I, I tie the two questions together a little bit. I mean, I think, you know, Bill raises a very provocative issue, which to be honest, I haven't seen a lot of discussion in the US. Maybe I'm not, not um, reading the right things. But I, I think once you start to talk about punishing a nation state by pulling away their IP addresses, now you, to use the second question, now you are putting that entire system into a, a, a position where the nation state may respond, and that would be uh, more of a military response. It could be to actually attack or try to damage um, that, that entire structure. So although I agree with Jeff that much of the real security issue we face is not, is not really military, there is a tendency to focus on the worst case. And certainly if you looked at you know, uh, the power going out in the Ukraine in 2015, 2016, um, there have been instances where there have been things that look like they're close to an active war. And I think one of the things we can do that would be valuable would be to look at exactly a proposal like this, which, you know, your first reaction may be, okay, well, if someone's going to shut down the internet for their citizens, we ought to take them offline as well. The escalation issue is always important. One other area this comes up with, by the way, is in the financial services area. We've tended in the last few years to look at financial sanctions as an important tool, I won't use the word weapon, in ge dealing with geopolitical issues. There is a risk that as you push more and more sanctions out there, you put the um, object of the sanctions in a position where they start to wonder, are they benefiting more from the financial system or are they, not, or are they losing more? And then that raises the question whether they will try to break that system as well. Exhibit A is North Korea. North Korea doesn't really play in the financial system, so they basically operate as criminals. And we've seen some of the evidence of that, um, you know, the attribution to the Bank of Bangladesh. So I think that this is a great area for examining unintended consequences uh, that can sometimes exacerbate our situation. Uh, it, was a, it was an interesting question on the militarization. What I feel uh, when we have international discussion in international bodies, again, I'm referring to the United Nations, Whenever we try to discuss preventive measures, talking about, for example, about international humanitarian law, law talking about Article 51, inherent right of self-defense, possible countermeasures, when we want to talk, discuss them in the preventive, deterrence mode, then we are accused by some countries militarizing or, or being, too, uh, being too violent in cyberspace, which personally I do not agree. We, are to we want to talk about these matters from the perspective of prevention, so that we know what are the rules, so that we know if Article 51 says that there is inherent right for self-defense, UN Charter, what does it mean in cyberspace? So we are not war monitoring, definitely not. 
but we want to see more discussion there also from those states who see that in that case we are war monitoring. Well, anybody else on the questions? Lata, yeah. please. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, I get the point which you're saying, uh, Bill, but I think simply withdrawing services or withdrawing IP addresses from a country that has to shut down on a law and order problem, for example, uh, would not really solve the problem. You know, you have to look into why did they do that? You know, in a case where there was likely to be mass loss of lives, there were likely to be riots, there was likely to be violence on innocent citizens. Uh, would it be fair to regard it as a denial of services simply by that government and to withdraw the IP address system from them? I think there has to be a system of a negotiation, some kind of mechanism set up where you examine that it was justified or not justified. And uh, I think to simply have an automatic reaction to withdraw the IP address system from that country would not really be viable in today's world. To be clear, my question is not about that policy. My question is about how we get North America and Europe to take policies generally that emanate from developing countries as seriously as they take their own internal conversation. Agreed. Uh, Carl. So oh, just on the uh, on the policy proposal, I, I agree with the latter point that you made. I I don't think I hadn't thought about it that much, but I don't think it's going to work. If, if you look at sort of practical examples, there have been examples in the world where governments have taken entire regions off. To take just one, uh, X numbers of years ago, the Chinese government took the, the entire area of Xinjiang off the net uh, because of domestic problems there. Is it realistic to expect that we would take China off the net in such a situation? Uh, with due respect to the minister of Zimbabwe, who was evidently in favor of the proposal, I don't think it's realistic. Uh, to reflect on what Bill said, I absolutely agree with you. Because what I, again, in the international discussions I've participated in, I see that cybersecurity is a topic for rich white countries. Mm. Even if there are developing countries in the room, usually they do not speak up so much as others. And some countries need lots of capacity building, lots of awareness raising, educating, I don't know, on strategies, on what's happening internationally before they are able to participate on the level that is already happening in the North Europe and, 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 and the, in, in the West. I'm not saying about all countries, not about all countries. But with my experience in the United Nations, I see that the divide is there. And that's not good. Because cybersecurity can't be a topic for 40, 50 countries. We can't avoid 100. And in the end, when cybersecurity is an ideological question, we have two different ideological understandings of the use of ICTs. On one hand, countries who see the benefits, want to take advantage of the benefits, the others who see it more like of interference into internal affairs, who see more the threats coming from the use of ICTs. We need the developing countries to make up their mind. And we want them to take our approach. We want to explain to them that the approach of taking advantages and facing challenges is the right one. So it's a very good question. I don't see I the audience. Do we have do we have Andrietta or Abdul in the audience, our commissioners from Nigeria and South Africa? Well, no, but we have China. <laughs> but uh, you wanted to say something, Lee Sadong, and then to, yeah, and then to I, Jeff. I just have a clarifying point. Uh, I think it's, a, it's one for discussion, but I just want to give a very quick comment. If you recall our memory for the internet, because the internet is the network the net, networks, because we define the protocol to connect different uh, networks. Mm. So the ATF will play a very important role for the rules, for the technical protocols. But if we, if we want the government rules, I think definitely is yes. But how to do that, how to make sure everybody, every country in the world can get involved, that is very important. So maybe we can use the philosophy for internet. We can discuss the government, uh, governance on internet or government, governance of internet. Why we can build the internet of governance? Because there are different kind of governance models in the world. How to respect the different kind of gov governance model based on the different kind of culture and history. So we need to build the internet of governance. 
And also, we should help other developing countries to build their governance model and then connect them into the internet of governance. I think we need to adopt the philosophy for internet. Thank you for your remark. And, uh, I just had a quick point, and Bill, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think oh, that uh, proposal, it, it wasn't withdrawing the internet address mm -hmm. base of countries, just they weren't going to get any new allocated address blocks for a year okay. or two years or something. Two so, stages. two stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the. I just wanted to, didn't want people to get on thinking that it was some kind of punitive withdrawal of address base. Mm -hmm. Though oh, everybody's rejected. connected. It was rejected. It was, it was not good. adopted. Mm -hmm. Okay, we ran out of the time, but Henrietta came. Henrietta, please. Henrietta is our commissioner <laughs> from uh, South African Republic. And from civil society. Well, not much to add. It's been very inspiring, and I feel encouraged. I really like the idea of the janitors and Joe. I think the only thing I can add to this is that <laughs> Um, we're not just talking about core internet infrastructure. There are also core values, freedom of expression, protection mm, yeah, of yeah. privacy. I also haven't heard enough about users. I think I've, I've heard a lot about the security and about, and, and about defense and defense, but I think we need to bring that angle into the commission's um, work as well. Protecting the core has to be more than just protecting the core infrastructure. We also have to protect it as a commons, um, which, mm. which is bound not just by common infrastructure, but also common values. And I would put human rights values mm -hmm. for a front and center of that. Henrietta, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was just a very brief introduction into the work of the Commission. Please stay tuned and visit our website, cyberstability.org. After our first meeting, which we'll have tonight and tomorrow, we will agree on the, I hope, we will agree on the topics that we will study more carefully during our meetings. So please visit. Please feel free to be in touch with us. We wait to hear from you and to hear about your opinions. Thank you.